What if there was a great flood of 899? I mean, how do you think that would affect your, uh, your migration, your exodus, your flow? Man, I always give love to AD, the truth seeker, man, who, who said this a long time ago, man. Uh, these damn dams, man, are jamming up our flow. And we're going to get some more recon, man. Love to the brother Yosef, the real, dropping serious recon, you know, connected to the so called natural disasters, these so called earthquakes. And how these dams are directly correlated, you know, with these earthquakes. A lot of earthquakes are caused by this shutdown, this jamming up, this damming of the water flow. So whether we're talking man-made, man, or <coughs> straight up Hawa sink, you know, it's all in Hawa's design, but you know what's going on with this flood of 899 out of the book raising arizona's dams daily life danger and discrimination in the dam you get the rest by ae rogue r-o-g-g-e all right all right okay you know i just was digging on a lot of this yourself the real drop love to the bro man so Make sure you're in that classroom, man, every Sunday, 7 o'clock Pacific, man, right after my jigger. Go ahead and get jiggy, man, in that 432 sweeping frequency, man. You know what I mean? He, he's just sweeping up the dust particles, man. My jigger just, uh, you know, jamming beautiful instrumentals, kicking poetic vibe on top of you, thoughtful vibration. Thinking out loud, man. What can, you know, what can we say, man? This is the Eat the Squad. It's the squad that's in the ether. The ether is our flow, man. You can get it on the app. You can get it right from 432thedrop.com. Learn more. And just get there, man, because we talking this. We talking this, and, you know, we ain't just talking about it. We being about it, man, because it, you know, spills over, man, into uh, another, you know, great investigation. We got, we got so many going on. You know, whether we're talking about the Grand Canyon and the cities of gold, Preston John, you know, we're digging more in orientation, but, you know, right here, man, I want to talk about the Great Flood of 899. Now, it's hard to find recon on this, so I know I got some master researchers, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not just presenting something that's like a finished product in Drop Nation, man, we... We, we share the drop, man. We don't, man, I ain't got to wait to try to present something as a fact. I want to present it in a form that gives you the, you know, freedom, freedom to, you know, think it over, think it through, man. Dig on it. Oh, sorry, I got the hiccups. You know what I mean? So, when it comes to, you know, this type of, you know, information, I just want you to dig on it, man. I don't want to tell you how to think about it. Just, just don't. Just get out the mind of a hijack. You know, that's all I would say. You know what I mean? Get out the mind of a hijack. We're going to get back into chronology a little bit. Because the chronology plays, man. That's another investigation. And it all leads to one, one cross, right? One point. A point of intersecting lines. One town. One sign. One maquis. One monument. Let's get it from here. The Great Flood of 899. The variability of the Southwest climate becomes more obvious with each additional year of weather records. Good records have been kept in Central Arizona for less than a century and were almost non-existent when Roosevelt Dam was designed as the first major water storage dam in Arizona, man. And look out for the next drop we're going to be digging on. You know what I'm saying? Uh, just a lot of this information regarding these dams uh, connected to just a lot of drop, man. <laughs> just a lot of drops. So just, just tune in, man. Just tune in. I mean, we're going we're gonna to go over the, uh, what's it called? The report from Iron Mountain, man. Again, man, you got to get in the classroom with Yosef Terrell because, you know, he's 
youth is going to be leading you to the water. And we're going to be sharing it over here all day, every day, man. So, hey, hi, yourself, the real. So this first major water storage dam in Arizona. All right, they're jamming up the water flow in Arizona. Now, let's go. A crucial step in the design process is determining, determining the magnitude of river flows so that spillways can be sized sufficiently large, safely pass floods without overtopping the dam. <clears throat> and part of what we're going to get and part of what Yosef has been dropping is that these are just like little... You know, you know what I mean, like, just traps, you know what I mean? These are traps that are just, like, loaded, like, fully loaded. You know what I mean? Once one of these things breaks, it's like a damn near a, atomic bomb going off in that area, man. Because it's just, I mean, it's disastrous when they held it up this much and they just let it flow on civilization that has been living as if there was no water that's supposed to flow right there on top of them. But these dams say, hey, here's all this area. We can start building it. <laughs> then they break the levees on your ass. Seemed like a setup to me, man. So this crucial step in, this, in the design process, right, of this... Of this mechanical water flow breaking system, system called DAM dam. I just want you to dig on it. Dam. Alright. Water flowing over the top of a dam can quickly erode it, leading to catastrophic failure. So you're just being set up for a catastrophic failure. Alright. Such as such as happened at Walnut Creek Dam in the Hasa Yampa River in 1890. All right. Precipitation records compiled since the completion of Roosevelt Dam and the lower dams on the Salt River have led hydrolysis to rethink the magnitude of floods that can be expected. This is why Roosevelt Dam is being raised by more than 70 feet, so they want to make it higher. Okay, let's go. Now listen up. Climatologists have come to appreciate a statistical paradox. They have detected little evidence that the average climate of the Southwest has changed or is changing significantly, but they have come to realize that it is a normal. It is normal to expect huge variations above or below the averages in any given year. A recent study extended historical climate records back into the prehistory by analyzing the varying widths of tree rings and the salt and verde watersheds. <clears throat> so, when you hear about the Gila system, and you know we'll we'll get into what this Gila River is, you know, a bit later. But I think I put up something right here. So when you talk Gila River. Or Old Hom. <laughs> Old Hom is what we're going to be digging on with the Ha Ha Kam or Ho Ho Gam. I heard the Ute Aztecan. Ute is Udah, Udah, Judah. Let's go. Kelly Akamel or simply Ekamel. Aka Akamel. Keshwa. Alright, I mean, you're going all the way back. Tributary of the Colorado River. Now, we know enough to know, you know, do a little bit of map study, then you realize on, you know, older maps, it's just Utah territory. Before there's a Colorado, before there's an Arizona, before there's a New Mexico, all that land is simply called Utah or Judah, Utah territory. So anything, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, it's still Judah. It's still Utah. Now you're going to hear about this color red or this red river, right? Colorado. Or this red river or what they call Bierde. What they say that. Oh, we saw Bierde somewhere over 
go back to it's probably the whole cob, the whole cob drive. Whether the tree rings and the salt river and the salt and verde watersheds to reconstruct the annual flows in the salt river through central Arizona during the next years. AD 740 to 1370. Now, the verde part again, that's just, you know, what does it mean? Verde. Meaning, <clears throat> so we got Verde green, 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 okay? So anybody that knows the Espanol is like green, drop green, okay, Verde. Definitions though. Right. Italian and Romanian means green, green. All right, let's get it. So the salt and verde watersheds to reconstruct the annual flows in the Salt River through central Arizona during the years AD 740 to 1370. The study demonstrated that the average summer flows have been remarkably stable over this 630-year period. Okay, let's go. But winter patterns were even more variable than historic records doc document. Only about half or of the annual flows could be considered close to the average, about 900,000 acre feet per year. 900,000 acre feet per year. This means that usually or unusually dry years are much wetter than normal years are common. Now listen up. Here's the part. All right. The greatest reconstructed flow occurred in the year AD 899. When it is estimated that more than 2.5 million acre feet of water ran through the Salt River. So we're talking about a, a great flood. 2.5 million acre feet sure sound like a, a lot of water to me. Now says that runoff enough to fill Lake Roosevelt twice would have been much greater than any recorded during the historical era. Even in a desert, too much rain is as bad as too little. The resulting 630-year flood of 899 A.D. certainly would have devastated the Hohokam irrigation system. And we talked about the Hohokam simply meaning, you know, to disappear, those who have disappeared. Those who have disappeared. We're talking about a flood, a great flood. Now, you know, I'm going to jump around in the timelines a little bit. I mean, you know what I'm saying? We always got to be searching in between the timelines. I want to apply a little bit of chronology or true chronology, a little flamenco. I just want to see, you know, where the breeze, you know, brings us. You know what I'm saying? I just want to empty our cups a little bit in. I know, I know what you think when you think biblical flood. You know, I, I know what you think when you think Atlantis flood. And it's hard to put all this together. I mean, it could all be separate events. You know, more than we, you know, can normally conceive. Man, it, it can be duplicates of the same events. 
Yeah. I mean, how do we know Atlantis was not the biblical flood? And here's just, you know, how some historians talk about it today as it's Atlantis. And then you got Dr. Clyde, what is it, Clyde Winters, you know, literally writing about, you know, books about uh, Atlantis in Mexico, right? And then he's comparing T. Not Titlin to Atlantis. We're going to get this. We're going to get it. I'm just talking, you know. I'm just I'm just surfing the wave with you. And then you have, well, man, how recent is, how recent is this history, man? How recent is this history? Again, the greatest reconstructed flow occurred in the year AD 899 when it is estimated that more than 2.5 million acre feet of water ran through the Salt River. That runoff, the runoff enough to fill Lake Roosevelt twice would have been much greater, would have been much greater than any recorded during the historic era. So we're talking about the <laughs> greatest would have been much greater than any recorded during history. Sounds like a flood of biblical proportions, man. Even in a desert, too much rain is as bad as too little. The resulting 630-year flood of AD 899. And everyone seems to, you know, at least corroborate the fact that the water levels even today don't seem to have been fully lowered. You know, I was just talking to, you know, a bro the other day, man. Uh, and, yeah, we were just saying, you know, I mean, once the, once the water levels recede, you know, you're going to see much, much more of connectivity, many more kingdoms popping up, you know, much more in between, in between the timelines, if you know what I mean. 630, I mean, am I reading, and y'all reading this too, right? So, you know, I said, well, maybe they just jiving about this 899 flood situation. I mean, a 630 year time period? Let's go back. The study demonstrated that the average summer flows have been remarkably stable over this 630-year period, but winter patterns were even more variable than historic records document. Let's go up a little bit. All right, you got prehistory analyzing the varying width of tree rings in the Salt River and Verde watersheds to reconstruct the annual flows in the Salt River through Arizona during the years 80, 740 to 1370. And this is their example of a 630 year period. So you know, at this, you know, they're reconstructing something from 740 to 1370. So I guess this 899, I mean, did it have something connected to 740? I mean, you know, did it really start in 899 or was was this just the uh, tipping point? You know what I'm saying? I mean, if they're starting at 740, if we start at 899, then we're just pretty much adding what about 150 years on top of that, you know, 14, 15, about 15, about 1500s, lasting until about the 1500s. And again, man, check yourself before you riggedy wreck yourself. You don't know shit about the 1500s, man. I don't care how many books you read. We don't know nothing about the 1600s, man. I don't care how many books we read and what we think we know, what what happened. We don't know shit, man. We got knocked the hell out, and history got rewritten, and chronology and timelines got flipped, maps got flipped upside down. Documents of war prepared against us. 
all the crafty council. The crafty council. It goes on to say, even in the desert, too much rain is as bad as too little, and the resulting 630 year flood of 899 AD certainly would have. Devastated the whole Hokam irrigation system decades ago, archaeologists defined a major change in the whole Hokam culture and labeled it as the tra transition between the colonial and sedentary periods. Transition, transition. Ain't you in transition right now, man? A lot of this migration going on, is that what they mean? This migration? Interestingly, Dated this change to about 900 A.D. You know, it's really, you know, weird how they have this 899. Like, oh, it's 899. Why not 889? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, how much do you know about the 800s in America, man? I mean, we're all talking America, right? We're talking the ho ho I mean, you, you, you know where the ho ho is at. You know where Ho-Ho-Com is at. Ho-Ho-Com, man. This is Arizona, right? Let me fall back, man. Fall back with me. We're connecting to Anasazi. We're saying this is all one people, man. One migration. And they, what, migrated into Mexico? You know, and then you have this... I'm getting them out. I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it, man. I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it, <clears throat> you thought I was. You thought I was playing, man. <laughs> Atlantis in Mexico. I know it's small. Pull up all these links, man. This is a new chronology.blogspot.com. The Mandy Discovery of America. Okay. Now, you know, he's one of those Afrocentrists. Kind of like a Horace Butler. But he is digging on real spill. Involving Atlantis and involving Judah right here. Right here. <coughs> Alright, so. You know, you have these. This is, I guess, Plato's depiction romanticized. It looks a lot like Mexican archi architecture. Right. Now, this is an artist concept of what Atlantis of San Lorenzo Tinatitlan once looked like so when you look at all oh, the 1300s 1200s 1300s Tinatitlan's being set up we will get more into that you know who's it being set up by you're talking Toltecs right and then you have a romanticized or Greek architecture version of what Atlantis city looked like according to Plato you just compare these. Tina Titlin, Mexico. Plato's Atlantis. I mean, it's an interesting correlation. You can dig more on. Which is why Dr. Clyde Winters wrote a book called Atlantis in Mexico. All right, all right. I'll be back. I'll be back. We will be talking a little three Indias. You know what I'm saying? A little three Indias. Because I ain't going crazy, but... This is Florida. <laughs> this is a Roman map of Florida. And here you have India. So where are you, my naga? Where are you located? This ain't the India that's supposed to be another continent, India. This is all connected, man. This, this is all Mexico, right? This is all Atlantis, right? Mm-hmm. We're just connecting some stuff. We're just talking about the ho ho Kong. When we talk ho ho Kong. You know, we're talking right here in the four corners. We're talking at a size. All this, we're talking Toltecs. We're talking the Israelite migrations right here in Judah. Utah, Utah, Utah territory. But go. Because we're going to take our time with this. We're going to surf the way. Wow, Shabbat up, man. What it do, man? Uh, to all my Shabbat, uh, what it do, man? Just a quick what it do for you. Let go.
It's currently 319 in uh, Los Angeles, California. <sighs> as long as I got my uh, my nice little alkaline, I think I'll be okay, man. Let's go. I got four sleeping babies, you know, so I got to keep it down. You know? but, you know, let's go, let's go. I got you. So we got this great flood, 899. There's no indication in the archaeological record that the Hohokam did not feel severe or feel secure in their way of life before it collapsed quite suddenly. At least from an archaeological perspective, approximately a century before the Spanish explorers arrived in 1539. So... There's no reason to believe that they weren't, you know, real cozy. But then what happened? To what levels of rainfall should cultures and desert environments adapt? By building storage dams and mining groundwater, our culture has chosen to rely on a much larger supply of annual water than did the prehistoric Hoho Kong. As a result, our population is much larger and our life way more complex than the Hoho Kong ever imagined. Really? Didn't they ever imagine more complex than Atlantis? I mean, is that, is that, is that, is that what's happening? You know what I mean? T not titly. I mean, you got to compare this to some stuff like Dubai or something, man. They pulled up in fresh water, man. Fresh water aqueducts, man, when they found you here. And we know that is an American Holocaust by David E. Standard, man. So, you got to watch how these guys be, you know, flipping stuff. Oh, yeah, we... We got a much more complicated system now. Nah, man. Nah, man. <laughs> As a result, our population is much larger. Our population is larger because we've been invaded and invaded and invaded and invaded and invaded and invaded. You ain't saying the population of these indigenous people is much larger. I don't hear you making that correlation. <laughs> when it was just us kicking it over here I think we were just fine now we got some overpopulated scenario popping off now we got you know lack of food supplies and you know all kinds of stuff but you know, let's talk about this famine man Let, let's talk about this biblical size famine man this, this flood of bi biblical proportions <laughs> now it says could a string of not average but normal dry years or another 630 year flood be disastrous for the complex system we have built in the Sonoran Desert? And again, it's telling you another 630 year flood. In case we didn't get it the first time. I mean, am I reading this wrong? Or are they saying that there was a flood that lasted 630 years? I mean, basically, when you add all that up, you're pretty much hitting this, you know, the Columbus invasion period. I mean, did, did Columbo just get some type of tip? <laughs> like, oh, it's time to invade these, these darkies over there, right? These cons over there. These Saracens over there, right? It's time to invade them, man. They, you know, they're vulnerable. They're just coming off a long long flood. I mean, this is, you know, I'm just thinking out loud, man. I'm, I'm chilling with my jigger, you know what I mean? Spanish explorers arrived 1539, so yeah. 630 years. Man, all right, you know, I'm just trying to think about this, man. I'm just trying to, it don't mean that you was in some type of arc for 630 years. It just means, you know, you had to go to higher ground. You know, I'm just digging on it with you, man. I'm trying to figure this out, man. 
here's another source on this uh, 630 year flood or this flood of 899 we'll get it from here the prehistoric cultures of the American Southwest were complex and they occupied diverse environments like Greece. The Southwest is a semi-arid region with rugged uplands and alluvial valleys. The geographical scale, soils, and available plants and average rainfall are all quite different from Greece, but the puzzle of prehistoric people occupying a farming area that appears inhospitable today is present as it is the question of whether the ultimate deterioration of these areas were primarily the result of climatic or human factors. Hmm, natural or man-made. This is out of a book called Human Impact on the Environment, Ancient Roots, Current Challenges by Judith E. Jacobson. All the sources are below. Just click uh, feature links, man. The subjects of the next case study are the Hohogan, right? The Hohogan. Remember when we talk Hohogan? Merriam Webster. You know, you're talking the old Hom. Old Hom. Old Hom. Utah. Utah, Judah, Utah, Judah, Judah, Aztecan. Alright, you talking Moses, you talking Joshua. Language of Southern Arizona. Also spelled like this. Oh gong. Showing you that those G's and C's and K's be interchangeable and the vowels don't really matter. Literally, those who have gone, have gone. Well, where'd you go? Well, where'd you go? Some say disappear, man. Where you disappear to? All right. Back to human at impact on, on the environment, all right? Is it human? Is it a virus? Is it, is, it a, uh, is it a spell? Let's go. We're talking climactic or human factors. Let's get it bigger. The subject of the next study are the whole calm of what is now Central Arizona and the Anasazi of Chaco Canyon and what is now Northwest New Mexico. These cultures are considered by many to have attained the highest level of sophistication and political organization of any prehistoric Southwest society. Why? Because these are Israel. This is Israel. This is Judah. They can't even front. They're not going to give you titles. You got to see through it, man. You got to dodge the hijack. You got to see through the timelines. You got to know they're talking the Utes. They're talking the Udaw, Utah, Udaw, Judah. Yo, Udaw, Hawa, Udaw. You're talking the Toltecs. You're talking Sylvanus, Toltecs, Solomon, the Builder. You're talking Kalelus, 775, right? Theodorus, we, we, we're going to touch on that. Don't even trip. Don't even trip. Don't even trip. Because whether, we, whether we're actually talking 899 or 775, and maybe that's just another reflection back in our timeline. Maybe that's the beginning. Maybe it's really going down in 1899, as far as we know. How many reflections and duplicates and phantoms are there? Where's the real spill? It's like the uh, House of Mirrors. You know what I'm saying? With the, the last dragon or, or Bruce Lee's Return of the Dragon. He was in the House of Mirror. And he tried to look for the right, you know, right right cat to kick in the chest bone. He's like, man, where is this dude? It's a, it's a gang of them. It's a House of Mirrors. And yeah, that's how we living right now. We're looking for the right hijack at the right time to kick in the chest bone. So they're calling these ho ho gums, right? They're calling these people right here in Arizona who have gone, who have disappeared. They're calling them. They've obtained the highest level of sophistication. 
and political organization. What does that mean? A kingdom? They had a kingdom? Are you cold word kingdom? What did the Papal Bull Doom Diverse is saying? 8, 14, 52. Subjugate their kingdoms, their dukedoms, their principalities, these Saracens, these darkies, these enemies of Christ. Yeah, we can't rock with Christ, man. We were always known as enemies. Enemies of their Horus. Their Zeus. Their Isus. Yeah, man. We see clearly. You were highly sophisticated and politically organized. You had a kingdom hijacked free. Yet the core areas of both were almost completely abandoned long before non-Indians entered the area. So they were able to kind of just walk right through. I mean, how did they just, how did they get all this with such little numbers? Did they... Did they damn near make us extinct? Or are they hiding the fact that there was an extinct level of event? That they continue to, you know, perpetuate with biological chemical warfare, with the Black Plague, and, you know, bottling up all their disease, going around spreading their disease freely on purpose as a form of war, the same thing they do today. But... How many of us was here to really greet them? I mean, we we trip off these numbers. We're like, and ain't no way they took that many of us out. Could there have been an extinction level event? Hmm. I'm just I'm just trying to dig on this because we're gonna keep digging. You know, let's go, let's go, let's go. So you were highly sophisticated. Almost sound like some Atlantis talk, right? The Hohokam were very effective irrigation agriculturalists who colonized the desert alluvial valleys of the Salt and Gila rivers of central Arizona and the tributaries. They lived in clusters of semi subterranean pit houses spread along the banks of canals they dug to water the fields at their peak between 900 and 1200. Remember these, remember this timeline here, remember this point right here, remember this migration. Because you got T. Not Titling popping off right after that. <clears throat> Some of the communities, including hundreds of houses, had platform mounds and ball courts at their center. So hundreds of houses had ball courts. I mean, I was like, you know, <laughs> I got a house with a basketball court in the back, you know. These people dug and maintained over 100 miles of canals in the Phoenix area alone. Given its heat and aridity, the area that became the Hohokam heartland was not attractive to large number of settlers until effective irrigation technologies existed. But with irrigation, farmers were extremely productive and generated a sufficient surplus to support long-distance trade and construction. Construction of centralized buildings. At first, it appears that the Hohokam flourished in their river valleys for almost nine, for almost a thousand years. A closer investigation has led many scholars to conclude that the success of Hohokam occupation varied greatly. Three or four cycles of population growth were each followed by serious depopulation. Depopulation. Extinction level event. Recent studies of the growth cycles of trees and upland watersheds of these rivers reveal a high variability in precipitation. Variability in rainfall would lead to variation in stream flow in both drought, famine, right, and flooding in the Hohokam area. Nias et al. suggests <laughs> that major floods could destroy irrigation facilities that only significant construction efforts could replace. Nias et al. Right, 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 you know, stands for. You know more than me. Let's go. Offer the following reconstruction of events based on their analysis of the tree growth data. Listen up. After a major flood in 899 AD, three centuries of relatively even stream flow followed. The 
300 years of stream flow followed this major flood. So before we got 630 years of a flood, so I guess it would be even stream flow, more water flowing. Hmm. A condition favorable for the growth of irrigation systems and the population they could support during this time there may have been some minor destruction of facilities but only on a scale that could be repaired quickly by the relatively well-organized society that occupied the lowlands however beginning in roughly 1200 a.d two centuries of far more erratic stream flow followed with periods of low water followed by more by one or more series or seasons with catastrophic floods so it'll be period with damn near no water and then bang hella water and then no water. So too much water is as bad as too little water. You know what I'm saying? And this was kind of what seems like the continuation that they're factoring into this 630 year flood. It wasn't so much just all flood, you know what I mean? But it was just a period of flooding. Um, and even some that they were able to live in and develop irrigation systems. It didn't just wipe everybody out rapidly or nothing like that. But what was the result of it? You know, after 630 years in the 1400s and 1500s, what was the result? Mm. And it happened, did it happen more recent than that? I mean, I mean, we're just going to be looking at the timelines. But this 1200 period, right, it's very important, obviously. Then you got the Preston John to add into that and Genghis Khan situation. And that takeover was right after this 1200s. Or 1202, right? 1203. You got to put all this together. Then you lose your last noble image. I mean, what's really going on? The climactic pattern would have been too much for the whole whole calm to handle. They would increasingly not be able to reconstruct the irrigation works and would be forced eventually to abandon their homeland. Click this link, Evolution of Water Supply Through the Millennia by Andreas and Angelakis, A-N-G-E-L-A-K-I-S. Just, you know, let's get right into it. In 899 AD, a flood caused decentralization and widespread population movement of the Hohokams from the Salt Gila River Basin to areas where they had to rely upon dry farming. The dry farming provided a more secure substance base, eventually collapsed of the whole regional system, resulted from a combination of several factors, these including flooding in the 1080s, the hydraulic de degradation in the early 1100s, and larger communities forcibly recruiting labor or levi levying tri tri tribute from surrounding populations. In 1358, a major flood ultimately destroyed the canal works. So again, this is a continuation, according to this link here, of raising Arizona's dams. All right, by A. E. Rogue. We're just talking about a 630-year flood. Let's get it bigger. Let's get it bigger. A 630-year flood. Huh. flood more than 2.5 million acre feet of water ran through right this says steady stream steady stream kept coming the resulting 630 year flood of 899 certainly would have devastated the whole cop irrigation system getting back in evolution of water supply through the millennia by andreas and Kal all right <laughs> and just you know take that in consideration from 899 or maybe even 740, you know what I mean? That's what they said, something about 740. 
and raising of the dams. Talking about the Salt and Verde watersheds to reconstruct the annual flows in the Salt River through the central Arizona during the years 740 to 1370. So, you know, we got to dig on why they are starting at that 740 for their 630 year period. You know what I'm saying? But either way, we dig it. Alright, so this hydraulic degradation in the early 1100s, larger communities forcibly recruiting labor or levying tribute from surrounding populations. 1358, a major flood ultimately destroyed the canal works resulting in the depopulation of the Hohokam area. Culturally drained, the Hohokam faced obliteration in about 1450. Bang. Then what happened? Then suddenly it's all good, right? 1450, I mean, come on, man. You gotta rock with me for a second. Come on, you just got to ride with me for a second. I'm just trying to put a story together, man. I mean, we just trying to put a story together. Yeah, whatever, man. Wikipedia, man. Whatever, man. Actually, I'm going to get this one here. Now you got the Papu Bull Dumb Diverses, the Doom Diverses in 1452. Straight from Pope Nicholas V. Alright. Issued in 1452. Telling you to give authorizing Alfonso V of Portugal to reduce any Saracen, Muslim, or Negro, and who they call pagans. <laughs> The heathens calling you a pagan. And in any unbelievers and their Christus, right? And their Zeus's reduce them to perpetual slavery. Put them in slavery. When? 1452. Forty years later, Columbus sells the ocean blue, man. We got this before. You get the rest, man. You get the rest. We weighing all in single pre premises with due meditation. They had Plenty of time to meditate on this move, noting that since we have formerly by other letters of ours granted, among other things, free and ample faculty to the aforesaid King Alfonso to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens, pagans whatsoever, and enemies of Christ. They know that the Hebrews didn't rock with no horse. Can you dig But even the Greeks had black melanated gods, right? Or even Zeus is black, man. Bliggity black. The definition of black. Black on black, man. So, you know, this ain't white on black, man. Uh, when I'm saying these invaders and different things, I'm talking about Esteban Nico. We gotta get back to Esteban Zamori. I'm talking about those who are invading these lands, this Kalelus, man. This Oho Khan, right? Invading Israel. Why? When? 1452. And we're seeing a correlation. between the whole Hohokam facing obliteration in about 1450. Parts of the irrigation system, I mean, did, it, did they just walk on through, man? They just knew it was time to strike, man. Parts of the irrigation system had been serviced, had been serviced for, had been serviced for almost 1500 years and most likely were in severe disrepair canals silted required extensive maintenance and problems with salt all right man all right man it gets deep it gets deep man we're just talking ho ho come right
I mean, <laughs> it's just play, play. All right, in the past, in the past blog, this is from Aaron Ben Gilead, Gil Gilead dot blogspot. Put up the link. In the past blog, about ten years ago, in two thousand eight, I wrote about the Roman Jewish kingdom of Kalelus, which we know are the Hebrew Israelites here, the Romani. Let's go. In North America, connecting with the Tucson, Arizona artifacts, so defining Jewish artifacts or Hebrew artifacts, as written about by Professor Cyclone Covey. We read this book, Kalelus, every Tuesday, man, 9 o'clock. Get in the classroom, download the app, let's go. I also wrote about their connection with the Septimania. Sept means seven, all right, seven cities of gold, Hebrew kingdom, right? The cities of gold, the Hebrew kingdom, the Septimanian Jewish kingdom, all right? And the Welsh and Spanish royalty, 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 royalty. <laughs> I also linked them to the, mis the mystery of Tuatha de Danan, the Mananan or Danan people of the tribe of Zebulon were also known as the Frisians around 650 to 700 A.D. Whoa. So we got all this stuff popping off. And then you got this flood popping like, you know, about a century or so later, you know what I mean? They had left their kingdom of Kalelus. Remember, Kalelus means promised land. And settled in the Isle of Man as well as Another group in France in the areas of La Mans or Maine. Group in France in the area of Maine. And we know that Maine is just Mananan. Manan, Manan, Frisian kingdoms, France. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh, boss. So we looking for the real everything, man. <laughs> I want the real France, the real Frisians, man, the real Manans, man, the Mananans. I'm talking Dananans and Mananans, man. Mananan or Danan, who they call Tribe of Zebulon. Right? I mean, you, you would think it's Tribe of Dan, but they're calling it Tribe of Zebulon. Let's go. All right, all right. Some of the Frisians had embraced Judaism and Catholicism, while others remained or re-embraced paganism, and others held to elements of all three. However, the Frisians in the north were mainly pagans. The term Mananan, Manan, Mananane, or Maine, and other variants refers to the western lands of America. It can be confusing as it is a a name used for Frisians as well as for British and Welsh inhabitants of Kalelus. Okay, all right. You know, dodge the hijack when they're calling you pagans here. Because remember, they've been calling you pagans, man. Right? Subdue all Saracens and pagans. And don't let me go back into what a Saracen looked like. Sarah's sons. Man. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get to this chronology, you know, for the dismount. But yeah, just know you're talking man and man. You're talking whole Khan. You're talking Israel. You're talking Zebulon. You're talking you, dog. You're talking France, right? The Frisians, right? Frisian, Frisian, Frisian. Another group in France in the area of La Main, La Main. Hmm. Let's get it. We're about to get to chronology right before. I just want to give you a reminder. Of the same time period. Of the same flow. And then we're going to look in between the timelines. This is from uh, Daniel Lowe's book. 
Forbidden histories of America. Fair use, fair use, all up in your caboose. Fair use, man. <laughs> man, all right, let's go. Some of my reasons. All right, let's just get it. I'm just going to get right to it. I had suspected for years of a remnant of the ancient ocean. Ancient ocean. So when we talk old world, the the old India, the India Superior, the Atlantis, you're dealing with an ancient ocean, which once covered the eastern half of Utah. So you got, you know, like Mesopotamia, you know, like like just hella water. You know what I'm saying? Hella water. Alright. Remember this map? You got Cibola, Cibola, Cibola. You got Septim, Septim, City, Seven, Seven. You really start breaking these maps down. Tantantiak. Uh huh, let's go. So this ancient ocean covering east. The eastern half of Utah, for some time I played with the idea of the basin of the northeastern Utah retaining a lake having been fed by the underground rivers that are more abundant under our Utah mountains than any geologist will admit. So they're not going to tell you that underneath Utah is an entire ocean. Hmm? Arizona, there's an ocean under there, man. Colorado, let go. It is my belief that this lake existed from the days of what they call the crucifixion. Dodge the hijack. We're going to get into the timeline because if they're talking crucifixion, if they're really talking JC, <laughs> then they're going to have to get into, uh, you know, the 1050s. You know what I'm saying? The, the 1150s, the 1050s AD. Now, how does that play? Underground rivers, it is... My belief that this existed from the time around, you know, 1050, 1150 A.D. But they cut it off to this, to about 900 A.D. When another earthquake mentioned by the Roman Jewish colonies and Native American legend, all Hebrews, all right, both of these are the same people, the real ones, occurred causing the source waters to return to the underground subsiding day by day until about 1000 A.D. Till about a thousand AD. The dry farming provided a more secure subsistence base. Eventually, collapse of the whole conurbational system resulted from a combination of several factors, these including flooding in 1080s, hydraulic degradation, degradation in early 1100s. And then they got this cut off the same one right here, 1450. Just dig it on this, man. This is more interesting than even I thought it was going to be. You know what I mean? It always kind of happens this way when you surf the wave, man. When you surf the wave, major flood, 899. Okay. And then it says it. Beginning in roughly 1200, two centuries of far more erratic stream flow follows. So that's when you got the famine in these periods. But still, we're just talking about a 630 year period of, you know, basic, ba basically flooding. All right? From what we're trying to, you know, gather up here. So the the flow from uh, David Lowe, you know, is that these waters went underground. Because this whole area that had this ancient ocean, you know, contained this, it was this northeastern Utah retaining a lake having been fed by underground rivers. So these underground rivers lead to an underground ocean, and that ocean rises and falls. So in some ways, it was higher and then now it's lower 
And is it still as low as it was at a different time period? I believe more is to be revealed when you lower it some more. The old Latin maps are just to perfect a match to this no longer hypothesis as a shoreline. It's quite identifiable existing at one level of 6,000 feet. It would seem the existence of this very strikingly similar lake, which science claims existed 33 million years ago, just happens to be so close in appearance to the lake which appears on the old Latin maps. This lake was likely documented and kept from the rest of the world, kept from the rest of the world by the early Roman Jewish colonies. If you look at some of the maps done by the old Latin explorers, so these Hebrews kept it hidden, man. They didn't share all they dropped with invaders, is what they said. Even in the 1700s, it is quite obvious that they were lacking. They were lacking in the seeming well-guarded secret of the land of Kalelus or Cibola. Which is basically <laughs> what we're digging on. Kalelus, which means promised land. Promised land. Here are some examples of this lake showing Latin maps. You see right there. You see it. Cibola, Cibola. Alright, these lakes. More of these lakes. Granata, Pomegranata, the Pomegranate, the Promised Land. So well, this is just, you know, a portion of this lake fed by these underground rivers, which leads to more underground water. That's all we're saying. Granata, seven cities of Cibola, Sept, Sept, Septimania, seven cities. Man, 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 man. So you can dig out all this. Yeah, man. You know, and then that takes us basically to that drop. And we have to uh, factor in this exodus or this this migration. You know, very carefully, man. It's a lot of dropping this this uh, joint right here. We, we did like a seven part series, but YouTube took it down. They claim copyright and all this stuff. My like house. How in the world could it be copyright infringement if I'm just reading your book to the public, promoting your book for scholarship purposes, for teaching purposes, even if you were criticizing your perspective because you want them to be Roman Jewish colonies, white people, and we're saying these are Romani, Ramon literally means pomegranate in the Hebrew, Ramon, Ramon which led to the promised land, Kalelu's connection. Because Kalelu's means promised land. Or the land of America. It tells of Septimania, which we just got seven cities, seven cities ago. So when you talk lower France to me, now that we know that's connected with the Frisians, the Frisians, you're still just talking four corners to me, man. Hmm. You're talking about the Franks, right? Part and parcel with the Rus. And the connection of the Knights Templar with the Sylvanus Solomon connection. Let's go. The records speak of Theodorus as a leader of the peoples who lead the Roman lands for Calais In 775, Theodorus is none other than the Jewish king of Septimania, underlined seven cities ago, the king of the seven cities. We are also calling Ameri, like America, and Machir, the mark. They're also calling him Nehemiah, by the way. And we said, is this the, you know, as the scripture says, in the days uh, 
after Solomon's death, the kingdom is divided, you know, based on the get back that he had coming back on him, the punishment, right? So then there was an Israelite on Israelite war. So this appears to be, you know, a historical, uh, you know, parallel to that, you know what I'm saying? These Davidic princes, because Theodorus is a warrior, Davidic princess, a prince of David. And this is the house of Solomon that they're going up against. So it seems to be two Davidic lines at war. On the death, death of his father, Machir Theodoric, in about 765 AD, Nehemiah Theodoric becomes the Western Exilarch. These are the leaders during the Babylonian captivity. In 775 AD, Nehemiah Theodoric reconquered the American Empire of Kalelus. Kalelus was ruled by Sylvanus to Texas or King Solomon, right? Solomon the Builder, the hereditary ruler of this former Jewish ruled Roman colony, Hebrew Israelite Kingdom. Hebrew Israelite Kingdom in 775. Which is why the 1452 Papal Bull is saying, invade, search out, vanquish, capture, subdue all Saracens and pagans and other enemies of Christ, wheresoever placed, and the kingdoms. And the kingdoms, man. We're just talking the whole con. You know what they say? Where's that? So many links, you know. It's all good, but you know, we just cats talking about sophistication and stuff. Yeah, there we go. These cultures are considered by many to have obtained the highest level of sophistication. You're talking who? The Hohoka. All right. Anasazi. All right. The highest levels of sophistication and organization of any of these Southwest societies. Highest levels of sophistication. Again, we're talking about the kingdoms. Subdue the kingdoms of these enemies of Zeus. Dukedoms, principalities, their dominions, possessions, highly sophisticated possessions, movable and immovable good, whatsoever held and possessed by them and reduced their persons to perpetual slavery. Now you're in slavery and you don't know why. And to apply it appropriate to himself and his successors, the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities. So take their kingdoms, give it to our successors. Got it, got it, got it, got it. We're just talking about the highly sophisticated, the highly sophisticated, highly, highly, high level of sophistication. We're just talking about eight ninety nine, man. After a major flood in eight ninety nine, three centuries of relatively even st stream flow followed, and we know. That this migration popped off right after again going to the forbidden histories of America. You know, we're talking 899 flood, and they even started in 740 in terms of this period of 630 years, so 775 plays right in the midst of this. What popped off, man? When you talk about Solomon, man, Solomon, Solomon. King Solomon, the builder, all right, also known as Sylvanus, Oga, or Bravo, or Sylvanus told Texas, let's go. So when you deal with the Toltecs, when you start talking the Toltecs, and we ask what happened, Cause you know I can't read this enough. If it think I mean it just starts popping off. 
He also had a fleet of trading vessels like Solomon, right? Solomon, Sylvanus, Toltec, let's go. Known as the ships of Solomon or the swan boats. The ships are shaped like swans with its, with its sails like the wings of a beautiful gliding white swan. After the defeat of Syl Sylvanus, you're talking Solomon. The members of royal family were sent back. The royal family were sent back to Europe where they were under the protection of Nehemiah Theodore Rus. That connects us with this Russian Russia drop that we're about to get on the dismount dealing with our chronology and how they had a kingdom over there. They had a Jerusalem over there. You had this David line popping over there. And they put the family up here under protection. So they didn't just put them in slavery and start beating their ass, they just said, alright man, we, we got what we came to get, you know what I'm saying, we got the seven cities back under this line of David, remember David has many sons, right, so this line of David now got the drop on the seven cities, alright, but we're still going to protect our family over here in Russia, right, over here in Europe, the legends of Ogier the Dane, son of Godfrey, Cadro. Dune de Maïs actually refer to Tuatha de Danan, Dunan, who are also known as Mananan, or Maine of America. Oh, what's poppin', Maine? What's poppin'? Mananan, Maine, in the four corners. Maine, man, this is Maine, man. This is what, this is where it's at, and this is the main area. It's very important. Man and Anne. The Irish legend of Regamon also alluded to this family, which I would definitely want to dig on that. But just right quick, before we get this chronology for the dismount, Israel the third went south to the Toltec lands, Toltecs, that's right, Toltec lands of Mexico, and his grandson Makir Amerik. Okay, Makir, who we just Either this is his father, or you know, but it's related to this Makir Theodori that went to war. This Nehemiah went to war, reconquered the American land from Sylvanus or Solomon, the builder or a descendant, you know, however you want to look at it. So Israel the third, they call it, because a lot of these artifacts have Israel the third on them, different. Here's where the fourth on them went south to the Toltec land, so they started, you know, migrating south. Now, pay attention to the time period. And, you know, just to surf the wave, man, because this is interesting more and more with a dragonfly perspective. To the Toltec lands of Meshi, Meshi, Moshe, Go, Meshi, Moshe, and his grandson, Makir, a Mary. All right. Also known as Mixed Colto of the Toltecs, was the grandfather of Tapuzin, who is Israel the seventh priest of Joshua or Kitzikolto. And this is when you have to see clearly this is your indigenous history, it has nothing to do with the New Testament, that's only reflection. In no way are those the words, the actual words. Of this Kitsukuoto or Joshua that you're reading in the, you know, uh, Greek, you know, uh, Aramaic, whatever you want to call it, you know what I'm saying? This is not, I mean, to surf that particular wave, you, then you really have to be able to validate what you're reading in those Gospels over there and have them connect directly to your indigenous history and just, you know, anything solid that you know what you're reading <laughs> are the words of this kid's a cool you're gonna have to show out that translation connected to that translation because all we're getting is greek 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 we know that it's a reflection we know that they're reflecting this jc to reflect the tribal the tribal passion the tribal flow See, over here, he's not the star of the show. He's only leading you to the star, which is the great spirit. Over there, he becomes the star of the show. So it lets you know that they're using 
you know what I'm saying, this star power to create a new star, a new Joshua. Two different Joshua's, one's a reflection of the other. One is not the same. Kitsukoto is not, is not their Jesus Christ. The Mormons just said that because that's the best they can do in their doctrine to relate to a high messenger who also will return. <laughs> but this Kitsukoto did not write those words that you're reading in red. You know what I'm saying? So we have to really truly understand and stay grounded. Stay planted in the vortex of creation when we talk kids of cold. Now, how incredible and what are we digging on when we talk about Kier, especially connected to the Makir Theodoric. So, his father was Makir Theodoric, he's Makir Theodoric, he becomes Western Axelar. We're just talking 765. Ten years later, he reconquers the American Empire of Kalelus. Uh, the same Makir, or one of the Makirs, is directly connected here. Makir, Ameri, he makes gold to of the Toltecs, who's the granddaddy. So his grandson becomes priest of Joshua, or gets a cold. So we're saying Kitsukoto is rocking after 1000 AD. This is happening in 775, man. I mean, has our whole is our is our whole timeline inside out? Are we reading things backwards, man? Did they flip? I mean, how much? You know, we, we're gonna have to get into this timeline for the dismount. We gotta keep emptying our cup with what we think we know about the timeline, because damn, 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 these these damn dams, right? We gotta let the water flow, keep the water flowing. Priest of Kitsukoto who left Chalola for Rhoda in about 1000 AD. So we just got around a 1000 AD. That's when stuff got popping. All right, these included floodings in the eight tens, early 1100s. the Chaco Cannon and then you know you, you open up a whole nother whole nother level in the flow try to see this part about 1000 AD one of these docs I think we just read The Pueblo with, you know, first people, same thing, man, same dang thing. Uh, all right, let's just get it, man. So, you know, obviously, you got this flood, 899, which we're just now reading about, which I'm just now hearing about, this, this flood popping off of 899, all right? But we know it's not just, uh, you know, flooding like we're thinking, flooding like, you know, just got to be on the boat the whole time. You know what I'm saying? We, you know, there are some still low lands and they still are working with some areas, but it's 1,000 mark, you know, they start, they start to, uh, oh, oh yeah, we, we read this in the same document around page 30, so we can go back to that. He rejoined the remnant of the rodents who led east and then back to Europe and some of the Jewish road and sailed into northwest Spain. So you got Hebrews in, in Spain. Now that 1492, you got all these Hebrews or Jews expelled from Spain. But they basically migrated back to Spain, right? Because, you know, this is, this is all our territory anyway. And all that starts connecting with this Rodrigo, the 
this Lancelin, which I'm calling Lancelot, and this continuous uh, Davidic Exilarch family, man. You can keep reading on it, man. So, you know, in case you think this is play, play. Let's get a few minutes of this from Vata Hung, man. What it do? Much of high, man. Uh, fair use and, and all they caboose bone. All right. This is history, fiction, or science. And it's dealing with this Anatoly Fomenko chronology. Let's get a few minutes. And I'm just going to, you know, dig on. Um, Yeah, we're gonna dig on Cox Cox, man. Back to that uh, indigenous myth of the uh, Noah story, man. And, you know, somebody named Cox Cox, man. So let's get a few seconds and I'm gonna read it to y'all. Let's go. Anatoly Fomenko decided to find out how the world really looks as a story to this end. He achieved a tremendous feat. Для этого он проделал колоссальную работу. Исследовал сотни старинных текстов, таблицы, лекций. He studied hundreds of, hundreds of texts, ancient texts, tables, records, books, reviewed the ancient and medieval history of Europe, Egypt, Middle East, and the Mediterranean. Летописи, хроники. Проанализировал древнюю и средневековую историю Европы, Египта, Ближнего Востока, среди... This is a side note, I think that's, that's his only flaw, is that he didn't fully incorporate the American, you know what I'm saying, history with this, and it would have led him to, I think, even more, you know what I mean, even more, man. Let's go. Земноморье. He studied most of the documents which describe the major events of human history, which allegedly occurred in the course of 6,000 years, right? Like the biblical flood and all that, right? From 4,000 BC to 2,000 AD, right? So, all right, just put it in perspective when we talk the flood of 899. Let's go. Documents that describe the main events of human history. Происходившие на протяжении шести тысяч лет, от четырехтысячного года до нашей эры, до 1900 года нашей эры. Чтобы представлять... To provide all this information visually, Anatoly Fomenko made a document for which there had been no precedent. He worked on it for six years. Всю эту информацию наглядно, Анатолий Фоменко составил документ, аналогов которому еще не было. Ученый работал над ним в течение шести лет. Все собранные сведения он изобразил в виде большого... All the information collected he depicted on a large chronological scale elongated along the horizontal time axis. ...кой хронологической шкалы, вытянутой по горизонтальной оси времени. На ней были указаны... It consisted of precise dates on which the founders of our traditional version of history insisted Scaliger and Batavius. ...заны именно те даты, на которых настаивали основатели традиционной исторической версии Scaliger и Batavius. First maps were drawn on graph paper, then the scanned images were transferred to a special material. Сначала карта была отображена на миллиметровой бумаге. Потом ее отсканировали и перенесли изображение на специальный материал. Этот уникальный... This unique method affects its size. The length of the map is 19 meters. And it was the first to geographically depict the history that is taught in schools and universities. Документ поражает своими размерами. Длина карты составляет 19 метров. Так впервые было создано графическое изображение истории, которую изучают в школах и университетах. So this is for Manco, all right? So he says this part, or this map contains tens of thousands of names, several thousand dates, information about disturbances, the main books of the original sources. Были распределены десятки тысяч имен, много тысяч дат, Информации о смутах, о главных книгах, о первоисточниках, о лет... Chronicles of their dating, the author's chronicles of the author, occurrences in astronomy and so on. ...о биг датировках, об авторах летописи, о хронистах, об астрономах и тому подобное. Потом... Then this material was evaluated using the techniques developed by me and my colleagues. К этому материалу были применены разработанные мною и моими коллегами методики, о которых я говорил вкратце. И я отметил на... And I noted on this map where there were duplicates, listen up, man. 
duplicates, man. Flood of 899, duplicates. That is, periods that were shown to be similar by these methods. How is this done? And Tony Fomenko divided the history of the world at certain points, then every era's detail was displayed on the time axis. Анатолий Фоменко разделил всю мировую историю на эпохи. Затем каждую эпоху подробно отобразил на оси времени. События, которые происходили... Periods which had similarities were moved to be simultaneous all the time scale. ...одновременно в разных государствах изображались друг над другом. Чтобы показать, сколько в традиционной истории существует повторов исторических... To show how much overlap there is in, in the traditional chronology of historical events, for man to assign each time interval a letter. For example, the era of the Second Roman Empire was marked by the letter K. The same letter was used to mark its duplicates for Manko had discovered. Эпоха Второй Римской империи была обозначена буквой К. Эти же буквы были отмечены все ее дубликаты, которые Фоменко обнаружил с помощью своих методов. Dru Other historical periods, as well as their duplicates, were identified by letters, for example, C and P, were also marked on the map. Другие исторические эпохи, а также их дубликаты, были обозначены другими буквами, например, S и P, и также были отмечены на карте. Other historical periods, as well as their duplicates, were identified by other letters. Well, we just read that they were already marked on the map. So as a structure emerges that shows both the time axis and repetitions of historical events, this map was named Global Chronological Map. Так возникла структура, которая показывала, как на оси времени расположены повторы исторических событий. Эта карта получила название Глобальной Хронологической Карты. Именно она... That is, it shows what should be the true chronology, true chronology, true chronology of historical events. Показывает, какой должна быть истинная хронология исторических событий. Стало очевидно. It became apparent that in this traditional chronology, there are three. Man, listen up. One more time, man. One more time for the dismount. One more time. Get it like it's the first time. One more time. There are three major time shifts. Scaliger and Patavius fooled us all. They pushed our real history back in time. So you're looking at the flood and way the fuck, whatever. <laughs> you're looking at, uh, you know what I'm saying, King David way in the BCs. But when you factor in the real chronology, the real connection, man, you, you got no time, man, for... You know, these duplicates, you got no time for, you know, this whole Jesus Roman situation when you got Joshua already rocking against who? <laughs> I mean, what? What's going on? Kitsukoda was fighting a war. What war is Jesus fighting? Kitsukoda was slicing and dicing the hijack, getting you back to your land. Jesus ain't even talking about slicing and dicing nobody. It's not the same story. Those are not the words of kids of Kohoto. Phantoms and duplicates. Because if Jesus is worrying about the Romans coming, if that's supposed to be in between the Greek captivity and the Roman captivity, then what's really going on with kids of Kohoto in reality? He's slicing and dicing nonstop. Completely different story, completely different aim, image, priest king. Because there is three time shifts. 300 years, write it down, 300 years. So something will happen today and later they'll come and push it back 300 years and say, no, it didn't happen in 2019, it happened in 1719. Just change the whole feeling of the thing. And then they'll push it back a thousand years. No, it didn't happen in 2019. It happened in 1019. They actually did this, man. They're doing it now to our children, to you. 
That's why we confused. Nah, 1800 years, that's like 2000 years. It didn't happen in the year 2000. It happened in 1000 BC. Well, damn, that's... <laughs> Can you imagine the stuff happening today? Someone comes and rewrites history and puts it in 1000 BC, 800 BC. Like King David. что в традиционной истории существуют три основных временных сдвига. Примерно на 300, 1000 и 1800 лет. И многие реальные исторические события средневековья были на бумаге размножены средневековыми хронистами и отправлены в прошлое. Как yeah, это могло быть yeah, yeah, yeah. сдвиг? Примерно на 300, 1000 yeah. и 1800 лет. Многие реальные реальные исторические события были копированы на бумаге и 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 были копированы Real events were sent into the past. Why? How? One, to confuse your ass. Two, to make you disconnected from your actual con, your actual, actual priesthood. Three, so that they could rewrite history. And they could write anything in between that. Now you got all this bullshit that you learn in, in history class from these whack-ass history books. <laughs> and it's just new bullshit. You got the New Testament. You got all this stuff popping up. You got all this shit. Damn, bro. Эй, мэй, wakey, wakey. Бытие средневековья были на бумаге размножены средневековыми хронистами и отправлены в прошлое. Как это могло произойти, если хронисты средневеков допустили ошибку непреднамеренно? Take the four ancient chronicles, they all describe the same events that occurred, for example, in Europe in the 1400s. So, okay, that's that's after that 630-year war of 899, right? Now you got the four ancient chronicles that actually are taking place after that. Все они описывают одни и те же события, которые происходили, например, в Европе в 15 веке. But the authors of these chronicles were living not only in different countries, but different time languages. They spoke and wrote in different languages and used different times, different languages, using different calendars. So that's if it's unintentional. This, this, this will be why, but we know this ain't no unintentional. They lived not only in different countries, but also in different times. They wrote and wrote in different languages. Использовали разные леты исчисления. Не удивительно. Not surprising when telling the same king, city or battle, they gave them totally different names. On accident, unintentional, or real hijack play play. Что рассказывая об одном и том же короле, городе или сражении, они давали им совершенно разные названия. The former chroniclers in the 1500s read these records. They decided that they were talking about four different eras. The ones in the BCs, right? So you're reading about Prince John in the, in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s that they say happened in King David's time in the BCs, man. And instead of putting these counts simultaneously on the same time axis, they arranged them in sequence, that is, one after another. Instead of putting them at the exact same time, they did They did your history like this, my naga. They left one chronicle in the 1400s, right? All right, so we're reading about... This invasion of America in the 1400s, the end of this 899 uh, year war, year of 899 war, 630 years, 1400s, Papu Bull, 1400s invasion. A second, they pushed back 300 years. So now we're reading about this 1100s, you know, Presto John takeover, Genghis Khan. A third, they pushed back a thousand years. Damn, so now, instead of the 
a 1400s, you in like the 400s, 300s, 400s, and that's why all this Chinese history, these these dynasties going back at it. And the fourth, they put back 1800 years. Now you in the BCs, man. Now you in the BCs, Jack. This is what they did to our history. Wakey, wakey. So it ain't crazy for us to say 899 flood. What's it got to do with the biblical flood? What's it got to do with Cox Cox and this indigenous, you know, Noah going down? Put them all together and you get a very long history. They stretched it out so that they could rewrite. They just had a big blank slate. They said, okay, look at all this new new area. Let's just write ourselves into history. Three books, all the same book, all the same history. Now, where does it belong? Only with the help of mathematical statistics can we have a truly objective analysis. Without them, unfortunately, it is impossible to construct a chronology. You got the link. I'm saying they're dropping you off all over the place, man. So when we did on Atlantis and Mexico, is it crazy? Tina Titnan, is that is that connected to At At Atlantis? We will talk Omics, right? We talk the All Man. Hmm. What's that got to do with Atlantis, man? I mean, you know, you, you should be asking all these great questions. All, all this stuff plays at this point. What's this drop right here from a new chronology that blocks by? They say the year 1044, year, 1044 years BM. I don't know what that BM is. Atlantis civilization invades the Mediterranean Sea region, establishes the Giza Pyramid. So the Mediterranean Sea would be over there. So they're saying, you know, Atlantis invaded that area over there, right? Africa. Set up the Giza Pyramids. <laughs> so that's the new Africa. That's the colony from here. Then a comet breaks over Western Europe and over the Northern Ocean and destroys the Atlantis civilization and submerges areas of its homeland. So we know that that comet dragon scenario, we already got that connection. So this dragon appeared and shut down the Atlantean hijack that was already hijacking the Americas. When we talk Egypt and, and stuff, their hierarchy was tied by elong heads then their appointed kings, right? So you got these, the ten dynastic, first ten, ten dynasties of Egypt coming directly out of Atlantis. Elong heads, connecting that with Peru. All right, let's go. Their edifices do not contain friezes, hieroglyphs, or mosaics. These edifices reuse their survival civilizations of Naguat and Mayapan are their giving, given carvings, all right? All right, all right, all right. Yeah, it's a lot of drop, man. I don't know. Rushing through it, but you can get the drive. Federal Imperial Realm picked up pieces uninterrupted by the cons. C A N. Thousand Year Dark Age. What does it mean, man? You know what that con kind of means? Thousand Year Dark Age. All right. I mean, you know, hey. Well, uh, you know, I can go. I, I can go in on this Atlantis. You know, what I mean, an ancient spiral-shaped harbor with high banks and dikes lining the canals or channels had once existed near Saint Lorenzo, Tenochtitlan. You're talking Mexico, exactly as described by Plato. So you see the diagram here. What does this Mexico situation have to do with Atlantis? Tenochtitlan, Plato's Atlantis. I mean. Oh no, man. Oh yeah, we're talking about these Indians, man. Uh, the three Indians. It's interesting here, just right quick. This is from uh, the chronology of Russian history. All right, it's another great link. Digging on the same Anatoly Fabenko research and more. Uh, I'm looking at this ancient Russia. Russia uh, Section it says Bla land or B L A land B L A land, also known as Black land or Babylon. 
I just remembered that they're calling this Blah Land Babylon. And then I clicked, uh, it's a lot, I mean, it's a lot of drop in here, man. Y'all Y'all have a good time. We just surfing away. Yeah, I clicked on this three India or this India situation. Man, where's it? All right, the three Indias as the three whores. And we know that these three Indians is connected to Preston Child, Emperor of the Three Indians, or the Emperor of the Three Hordes. Mongol means the Great Ones. Genghis Khan took over their emperor, right? He took over the Emperor of the Abyssinians, which is the Mongols, which are the Rus. Scandinavians believe that India included the Caucasus, all right? The river Edus, Edus, the name could also be related to Judea. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Y'all lucky I gotta keep it down or else I'll be throwing shit right now. Because you talked in the river Indus in relations with the three Indies or Judea. You talking King David, man. King David of Judah, man. Who is Preston John of the three Indies. Body bag, then. The three hordes. Hordes means order. Or author, like King Arthur. Author, order, hordes. Order, the order. Huh. The order of the three, huh? Now they got their trilogy, don't they? Their trinity. The Indy. According to the Russian word, it says over there, which also refers to a far away land. So the Mongolian, or the great. Right, Mongol means great. Great equals Mongolian Empire, Scythia, or Rusha, or the Horde, all the same thing. Indy, far away. <laughs> hey man, surf the wave, man. You know? It's a different perspective. So you're talking about the third India. The division of India into three parts, traditional medieval European geography. Uh -huh. Lesser, and then they want to make it all about that area over there, and that's what they are uh, falling short because they're not even thinking about the Americas. So remember that blah land. Oh, first, this is interesting. This is the fact that Scandinavian author locates the third India, third India or Tartar India in Africa. It means that this was really part of the Turk, T R K, Turk, Turk, Tarki, Turkey, Tartary. Remember, Genghis Khan is really ruling this Tartary against the real Mongol. The Tartar Mongol War, if you want to look at it that way. Our hypothesis about the three Indians, because we know it's not in Africa, or the three faraway lands identified as the three hordes or great empires, also confirmed by the following passage. All right, so three Indians are three faraway lands. So King David is the ruler of the three faraway lands. There are three India lands. One is right next to Bla land or Africa. Remember, Bly Land was also called Babylon, right? Bly Land or Africa or Turkey or Tartary, all the same thing. Ain't that something? Africa, Turkey, Tartary? Well, we know the Tartary makes sense. Bly Land, remember, we said is what? Bly Land equals Black Land or Babylon. Babylon. Babylon, Africa, interest. I mean, that's just interesting. You click the link. Uh, we talked about these comments, strange duplicates with the period, periodic, periodicity, periodic, you know, get the 400, 540 years inherent in Chinese and, and European comment rosters. All right, so there's a lot of these comments that they seem to be popping up every 500, 540 years, but here is some uh, explanation possibly. N. A. Mary Marozov discovered the following strange tendencies that character characteriz, characterizes all known comet or dragon rosters. Are right. Europeans as well as Chinese in the course of the analysis related in five forty four volume number six. All the ancient dragons or comets that predate 59 AD recur over the period of 540 years. Moreover, the large Lucane or gaps 
and common observation periods or dragon observation periods records recur after the same time period he wrote the following this is by no means a random occurrence therefore only two explanations are possible the first the ancient comets or dragons copy more recent ones so these famous ancient dragons are just copies of the more recent ones keep that in mind the time shifts right they push the history back so these ancient dragons are not as old let's go the second the real astronomical life of comets has a strange 540 year period which makes all comets recur after the passage of 540 years so we know that's baloney so we know we know that our timeline has been shifted and a Marisov also adds a third explanation is possible we believe it to be the closest to the truth listen up a shift of 540 years is also possible if the historical events associated with the sightings of all the European comets were shifted backwards in time by a factor of 540 or 1080 years right so we got those three shifts remember 333 then you got what 1000 something or 1100 and then you got the 1800 so you got those three shifts in time all right, we're just getting this dismount right here. We got these three shifts in time. Remember, these books is dropping all over the place, right? Математики можно посвящать объективно. They left one chronicle in the 1400s. The second, they pushed back 3,000 years, and the third, 1,000 years, and the fourth, 1,800 years. So 300 years, 1,000 years, 18. Hundred years, man, and they're saying <laughs> so. Either these ancient comments are copied more recent ones, or there's a strange 540 year period of their reoccurrence, or the third, which is likely closer to the truth, a shift of 540 years, a factor. That these comments or these dragon sightings were shifted back in time. By a factor of 540 or double that 1040 since it seems to be duplicating it could be you know double that right so 1080 so that adds or connects to this shift of about 1,000 years and Scaliger and Batavius popped up man and they even say it right here are known to us quite well they are indeed manifest so they exist in the Scaligerian version of ancient history so they're telling you that these shifts and time shifts are already manifest. They already exist in the Scaliger Batavius hoax where they shifted your timelines, man. And you know, just for the dismount, man, you're studying medievalism, man. A system of belief and practice inspired by the Middle Ages or by devotion to elements of that period. So we digging on our real chronology, our real period happening after the 900s. You know what I'm saying? To the 1200s, these are all the so-called medieval ages, and I guess we'll be called medievalist. But you're going to see a lot of this pop up on these medievalists, and really they're just digging on the reality. The reality. The reality, man. Who got the drop? They're just digging on the reality that your, your real history, man, was dropped off, man. It was pushed back in time. Back in time. This is another cool thing for you to dig on, man. History already referenced from the best historians. Well, you know, you can dig on some more recent um, floods and destruction. In 1899, seems to be all kinds of things popping off. So while we're digging on 899, you know, that thousand year shift, you could easily be digging on 1899. You know, but you dig on it. You dig on it, man. You know, you remember this Cox Cox, this Aztec mythology, right? When you talk about the Great Flood or even Noah's Flood, you got a flood popping off in the Aztec mythology. Cox Cox was the only male survivor of a worldwide flood. The Aztecs believed that only Cox Cox and his wife, she got Ketsu, right, survived the flood. They took refuge in the hollow trunk of a cypress which floated on top of the river and finally banked on the mountain Kulhawa. 
a wakan. They had many children, but all of them were mute. The great spirit took pity on them and sent the dove, which attempted to teach the children how to speak. Fifteen of them succeeded, and from these, the Aztec believed that Toltecs and Aztecs were descended. Ah, the Toltecs, the Toltecs. They're all coming from this flood scenario, man. And they even got some artwork, you know what I mean? Some artifacts to dig on, some more drop on the Noah flood, man. Aztec mythology, only Cox Cox and his wife were forewarned of the flood by God and survived by building a huge boat. This ain't Noah, this is the Aztec. The Aztec, you know what I'm saying, uh, legends, you know what I mean? And how does that connect with the flood of 899? I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, man. So, we're falling back, man, we've been surfing the wave. And this is just a little dismount. Remember, we get it like it's the first time. Parallel timelines in history. And totally. For the man going. Uh, although people use it then to make comparisons. We have an obvious circular argument here. What you need to always bear in mind is how things get dated. And particularly in ancient times. I mean, in modern times, we know to some extent how things get dated. But imagine you're, you're, a, you're a, a, a historian. Okay, from, say, 300 A.D. or 500 A.D., possibly even 1200 A.D. or later. First of all, it's not entirely clear that your intention in writing history is the same as the intention of a modern historian, namely to give a faithful uh, chronicle of events. We cannot take this for granted at all. As a matter of fact, it's a fair assumption that many ancient writings were, had a sort of moralistic purpose. They were much more uh, in keeping with, you know, you know, like Roman histories was showing you know, the grandeur of certain figures and being, giving uplift, uplifting accounts and so forth. This is very, very important because, because the results that we're talking about are going, in some cases are going to look and seem so preposterous to you. That, that you're just you, you will be very tempted to just turn your you know turn your mind off or turn your back to the whole thing and and what El and I are, are above all trying to do is not make you throw out the data you may discard Fomenko's interpretation of the data you may discard the interpretations that we have of the data but you shouldn't throw out the data in my opinion the data is incontrovertible. You see on the, the right hand side, this is the Roman Empire from 82 BC to the 3rd century AD. On the left hand side, we have the Roman Empire from the 3rd century through the 6th century AD. And we are writing the Roman emperors in the order in which they occur um, according to the chronicles, according to the histories, even according to modern history. But to read the diagram, the spaces say from here to here would represent the length of reign of that emperor. So, in other words, here's 41 years, a long reign. This diagram is supposed to show a kind of symmetry between a period of time in which you have a sequence of, of Roman rulers and then a period of time more than 300 years later in which you have another sequence of Roman, Roman emperors. Now, let's start here with, with Augustus. Okay, he reigns for 41 years, and uh, Constantine the Great Augustus reigns for 31 years. And you say, well, big deal, I agree, that's 10 years difference. But follow what happens after here. You have Tiberius uh, compared to Constantius II, 23 and 24. When we come to Caligula, it's four years and two years. He, um, Caligula is paired to Julian the Apostate. Uh, then we have Claudius, 13 years, and Valentinian, 11 years, and so forth. Now, so if you understand the principle behind the figure, it is meant to show the symmetry between lengths of reign of emperors who are understood to have reigned more than 300 years apart. Toward the end of the, the, this period in Roman history, uh, we have a sequence of four emperors who all reigned for less than one year. Okay, they were died or they got off by the, you know, the legions or whatever it was, and that's paired by a sequence of rulers who all reigned less than one year on the other side. Okay, very, very conspicuous. Now, the other thing that's interesting is this period, sort of in Roman history, ends with an invasion by the Goths, where you have Caracalla. Oddly enough, exactly on the other side, you have a second, let's put it, put it this way, quote, unquote, second invasion of the Goths. Okay, on the left, we have the Roman, the, the Roman Empire from the 1st century B.C. to the 3rd century A.D. Then we have the Holy Roman Empire from the 10th century to the 13th century. In other words, on the left here, we have largely the same people um, who are, uh, that we had on the, on the right-hand side in the previous one, but now they're being compared to rulers of the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, uh, a, a, basically about 1,050 years later. And you see the, 
we have another symmetry. And this is how it's... Thousand years later, symmetry, time shift. Reported. But remember, we have to bracket almost everything of this kind over here. Because we don't know what, what the, the veracity of the Chronicles is, what the intention of the Chronicles was, or even what the people really understood by it. I don't think anybody is any position, really, to make a hypothesis. You get a million ideas occurring to you when you really look into this. The many people that I talk to, they want to get a hypothesis, they want to go off and run with it, you know, to the exclusion of everything else before they understand anything about really what's going on. And I think that people have no business making hypotheses about this until they really understand the extent and the depth and the weight of what he has done. I mean, like any, I mean, any, like, really nailed down hypothesis, you know what I mean? Obviously, lots of crazy ideas are going to occur to you, but, you know, because they occur to me all the time, you know, and, and I try to follow them out as much as I can, but, I mean, we are not making hypotheses here. It's really we're not in a position to. Remember the little pattern up here, okay, where we have a little block of history here, and then we shift it back and shift it back and so forth? Fomenko's opinion is the only legitimate history. Now, this doesn't mean that nothing happened before this. The only history that our documents address themselves to um, is from the period of 300 A.D. up to modern times. Everything else is a projection of that material, that historical material, back in time due to the errors that scholars made in trying to synchronize relative blocks of history. Were they errors or was it absolutely vital that they switched everything up? Of that material, that historical material, back in time due to the errors that is the only legitimate history. Now, this doesn't mean that nothing happened before this. The only history that our documents address themselves to um, is from the period of 300 AD up to modern times. Everything else is a projection of that material, that historical material, back in time due to the errors that scholars made in trying to synchronize relative blocks of history. And remember, there are three shifts. One is 333 years, one is 1,053 years, and the other one is 1... 1,778 years. He has an account of each one of these and how these could have happened historically to produce those shifts. But his is what we might call one radical interpretation. Now, before you say this guy's out of his mind, what Fomenko does, given one pair of duplicates, what Fomenko does is says, well, can we establish astronomically which one is valid? So take, for example, uh, Thucydides' Peloponnesian Wars. There are three eclipses mentioned in the Peloponnesian Wars, and they occur, they're described with great fullness. There's an, a, a lunar eclipse, an annular solar eclipse, and another, another lunar eclipse. Uh, you can infer what the path of totality was and, and the whole deal from these, from this, these descriptions. The, the creators of modern chronology, namely Scaliger and Patavius, trying to astronomically solve the problem of those eclipses, were not able to do it without leaving out some of the data provided by Thucydides, who, by the way, says he was a first a witness of this. So what Fomenko did, he said, let's make no presuppositions about this. Where are the exact astronomical solutions for this triad of eclipses? And they turn out, it turns out to be one in the 11th century AD, and one in the 12th century AD, and no others. So what Fomenko does quite regularly is he will appeal to astronomical arguments to try to determine which is the principal one, and, and his, his conclusion, and however crazy it may sound, is extraordinarily well argued, is that the only legitimate history is the modern history from about 300 on, and most of that, by the way, um, is from 900 on. Most of your real history is from 900 on. Is it because of a flood in 899? Appeal to astronomical arguments to try to determine which is the principal one, and, and his, his conclusion, and however crazy it may sound, is extraordinarily well argued, is that the only legitimate history is the modern history from about 300 on, and most of that, by the way, um, is from 900 on. From 300 on, we've got like yeah. statuary documents and, and some things like yeah. that. Yeah. Most of the, he thinks most of the things that we think of as historical events really did happen, but the question is when and where, and maybe, of course, how many times. And he thinks well, it did happen 10 times, it only happened once, and most of that stuff happened after 900. Yeah. After 900, man, we do this for the prisoners. Free your mind.